Good evening, good evening, Faith family, and to everybody else out there that may be watching. Uh, tonight's lesson, this last Sunday, a lot of people were preaching on Pentecost Sunday. Uh, that's what we celebrate as Christians. But uh, the Lord had kind of led our service a little bit different this last Sunday, and, and God blessed in a mighty way. But tonight, I, I want to talk about this being filled with the Spirit. And, um, you know, that, that's what makes us have a powerful witness when we're led by the Spirit. But before we do, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings over our people. Uh, I had some uh, praise reports that were called in to me today. Thank you for blessing our people, God. And there's others that have some very important uh, needs that they call me about today. Uh, they need you to move in a mighty way. We trust that you can do that by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, Lord. We ask it and believe it in Jesus' name, amen. Um, the, the title to tonight's lesson is Being Filled with the Spirit. And we all know that scripture that says, walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And then they kind of, after they quote that scripture, usually they just move on from there. But when you, when you really examine this, when it says walk in the spirit and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh, that means if somebody is claiming that they have the spirit of the Lord or the Holy Ghost residing inside of them, but you see them constantly doing worldly and fleshly things, it kind of makes me wonder about them letting the Holy Ghost have rule and reign in their life. Uh, so if we walk in the spirit, we won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That means you won't see all of those open sins that they are committing on purpose. They're not going to do that just blatantly every day in their lives. So uh, I think that that's one thing that has kind of stolen uh, the witness from the church. People claimed that they were spirit-filled, and uh, you, you see them have a Friday and Saturday night of their life in the nightclub, and they're speaking in tongues on Sunday morning. Yeah, you know, I, I, and if you're being honest with me today, some of you have seen people speak in tongues and you know the fruit is not adding up. So let's make sure that if we claim we have the Holy Ghost, that we're not willfully and openly sinning because then we bring a reproach on the church. Amen. So we don't want to walk in the ways of the flesh. And it says Pentecost Sunday, and that means uh, literally 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, but the lesson overview says uh, uh, on, on a Pentecost Sunday, and that's the seventh Sunday after Easter, that's when people celebrate uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Bible declares that the gift of the Holy Spirit to the early church as promised by Christ and the prophets came on the Jewish feast called Pentecost. And today, if you say the word if somebody says, where do you go to church? You say, well, we're an assembly of God, a church of God, a church of God of prophecy. And, and they say, oh, you're Pentecostal. Now, what they mean is you speak in tongues, you know. So, uh, But penta actually means 50. And the tongues, uh, if you look back on the when, it, when the actual event actually took place, it said that men who were educated heard men who were unlearned that the Spirit moved on them, and each one of those men who were educated heard those men speaking fluently in their tongues. See, God's not the author of confusion. He wanted people that were present there to be able to understand what was going on. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, when, we, when we yield to the power of the Holy Ghost, it's not going to be a confusing thing. Uh, the Scripture says, let everything that's done in the Lord's house be done uh, decently and in order. So we don't want chaos there. We need to let the Spirit be the one that's moving in us, okay? But it says uh, it came on the seventh Sunday, and the number seven represents perfection, and, and how fitting it was that God gave the gift of the Holy Spirit on the seventh Sunday after the resurrection of Jesus, amen? The Bible declares that the gift of the Holy Spirit to the early church as promised by Christ and the prophets came on this celebration of Pentecost. Because of the spiritual and historical significance of this event for the church, Pentecost along with Christmas and Easter are the three major holy days 
that we celebrate, uh, when we celebrate the birth of Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and the coming of the Holy Spirit poured out on the on the early church. And, and people say, well, that speaking in tongues was for back in those days, for the day of Pentecost when it came into the upper room. That's not what the Bible says. It says it was for as uh, as many to as many as the Lord our God shall call, even afar. That's me and you today. You were empowered by the Holy Spirit for service to the Lord. So that's what we need in the church is a outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I thank God in our church, when you come on a Sunday morning, if you're not Pentecostal and you're not moved by the Spirit, you may be a little uncomfortable at our church when you first come and visit the first few times because the Spirit of the Lord, He's always there. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. People are raising hands. They're worshiping. They're speaking in tongues. We've seen people slain in the Spirit. We've had people healed in our services. People would be sick and say, I know the Lord has healed me. And they didn't have another complaint with that issue they were dealing with. So I thank God for what we've seen in the outpouring that we're experiencing and I believe if people today, if they would truly follow the Lord, get as close as you can, this is the day, this is not when we're to be anxious. We need to be saying, God, I trust you. Give us an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our churches because the harvest, it's ripe today. There's so many that are lost and don't know him. And you know, when you live the life in front of them, we're made overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. The the testimony may not always be a spoken word. It may be the life that you live in front of people. And this will influence them, give us a chance to win them because they see the Holy Spirit operating in our everyday life. Um, Let's look at the lesson outline. To be filled with the Spirit. And, And it's got an A and B section. Part A is the gift of the Spirit prefigured. And here it's talking about the seven elders that had, uh, the, the 70 elders, excuse me, that had the Spirit fall on them. Uh, then, uh, then others, two others prophesied as well. So it, in Acts, it was not the first place that this had happened. It happened when the 70 elders were, uh, were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they were being filled so they could go out and help to do the work and aid Moses uh, in the work that needed to be done for the kingdom of God in that day. So, and that's what we need it for today, that the Holy Spirit will empower us to do the work that needs to be done for the kingdom of God. The second part is the coming of the Holy Spirit. What is it that triggered? Number one, it was a promise from God and God's no respect to a person. He promised them if they would tarry and wait, that the Holy Spirit would come And we know that Joel prophesied that it would be poured out in the latter days on our sons and on our daughters. And we know out of Acts 2, it talks about how this gift was for uh, as many as the Lord our God would call, even afar. So so we know that the Holy Spirit is for us today for that same reason. Not that we speak in tongues to impress anybody. Uh, But matter of fact, I want to say this. The, the, the Holy Ghost is so much more than speaking in tongues. And I'm like Paul. Don't get me wrong when I say this. Paul says, I'm not against speaking in tongues. And then he went on to say, I speak in tongues more than y'all. But what Paul was saying was the Holy Spirit is not just the gift of tongues, but it's that power that operates in our lives. And he will trigger things in our brain. Every day, he will lead, guide, and direct you into paths of righteousness. That's what the Holy Spirit is for. So when did when did the promise come? Uh, why did it take so long when they tarried and waited? I'm going to tell you why. Because they need to be in one mind and one accord. Now, if you saw a church, if the people seem to be going in every direction, there's no unity, you're not going to see anything powerful coming out of that church. But when you see a church that gets in one mind, one accord, they're all focused on the Lord and the blessings of the Lord, 
then you're going to begin to see the Spirit operate in the church, and the gifts begin to operate in the church as well when that happens. Amen? So unity, that's what brings the power of the Holy Spirit, that we walk in obedience to the Word and we're in unity together. That's when the Holy Spirit can operate in our churches. The second part of the outline is to be Spirit-filled and living it in our everyday life. The, uh, the cr Christian community and spiritual worship. You mean when we have the Holy Spirit, not only is it going to aid us, because when you read the words, you may not remember that scripture every day of your life, but when you get in a place where that scripture needs to be applied, the Holy Spirit will bring that word to your remembrance. It'll bring it back to life to you, and it will help you in your moment of need. But not only that, but that uh, it, it helps us in our community because when, we're, when we have that powerful witness in our life, at one time, 3,000 people were saved and baptized by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and the second part of the Spirit-filled living is bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, see, people say, okay, I, I got the Holy Ghost. I received the Holy Ghost. We need to back up to the old-timey paths and think about what that meant. Today, people say, well, I got saved and I got the Holy Ghost. You didn't do that. If you got saved, you were forgiven of your sins. There's a second, a second part that the Church of God teaches and the Word of God teaches, and that second part is being sanctified where the Adamic nature is eradicated in your heart because the Holy Spirit is going to be with you and in you, and if he's going to be in you, the Adamic nature can't be living in there as well. He's not going to live and dwell in an unclean temple. So how do we know the temple is clean? We're sanctified. Well, what evidence do we have of that when we're sanctified and spirit-filled? You're going to have evidence of those things. You're going to have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness. There's characteristics that come out of you when you're spirit-filled. Just like a sinful person, you know what you're going to see when you get around most of them on the weekend? They're going to be drinking. They're going to be cussing. They're going to be fighting or arguing with somebody. There's going to be a lot of drama. And see, that's how you know who's spiritual in a church as well. If you see people in a church and the only thing they can ever do is, is talk about one another uh, and gossip and run one another down, James 3 tells us that that is deadly. That's poison. And we know that a house divided cannot stand. So that's not the that's not the Holy Spirit operating. If it's in the world, that's not the Holy Spirit. And if it's in the church, that's not the Holy Spirit operating. Amen. So we want to have goodness, uh, faithfulness, long suffering, uh, kindness, love, peace, joy. These are the things that the Holy Spirit uh, helps us to do in our life. And the third part of the lesson outline is being spirit filled. Uh, for unity and for service. Uh, part A says of one heart and one soul. And the scripture talked about they had all things in common and they shared all things. You know, um, I I'll tell y'all, uh, last night we had a little uh, episode. There was a light that had been left on in the church. And I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit, When you, you know when people love the house of the Lord when they are dedicated and committed to the house of the Lord. I got a phone call. It was probably close to midnight. Hey, pastor, there's a light on to church. We're headed down here to check out and see what's going on to church. And they walked the entire perimeter of the, uh, uh, of the church, the yard, checked on the doors and windows, went inside, found the light on, cut it out. You know, that's love after midnight for somebody to get up and go do that. That's the Holy Spirit uh, that, that that's leading them to do because most people don't want to go anywhere after midnight. Amen. You say, well, that sounds like a simple enough thing. M most people, you know, do not want to get up and go do anything at midnight or after. So, you know, we, we've got people now that are volunteering to cut grass uh, at the church. They weed eat, uh, they clean the church. And, you know, they're not seeking uh, anybody's approval. They don't care if it's ever mentioned. They are doing it because they are committed to the Lord and they love being a servant to the house of God. That's the power. And I know people say, you mean cleaning a toilet and cutting grass? Yes, 
Uh, the, for a person to do that, that is a labor of love, and that is the Holy Spirit that's putting that in their heart and empowering them to serve in the kingdom of God. Doesn't make any difference what you do. The Bible says, whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. God wants you to be dedicated no matter what. So uh, it's, it's when, we, when we have everything in common. You, you got people that'll teach Sunday school uh, or the young people's class. You, you've got people who will uh, work in the office. You've got people work in the media booth. Like I mentioned, people that cut grass, people that clean. It takes a community to work together to run the house of the Lord. That's having all things in common, and you can only do that when you operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So, uh, and the second part is serving by God's sufficiency. We need to realize that it's God who gives us strength. The word says it's God who gives us our strength to receive our wealth. You can't even get up and go work a job every day if God doesn't empower you and touch your body and strengthen you. All these things happen through the Holy Spirit. Uh, the golden text, Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, it says, be filled with the Spirit. Now, now this glass I've got right here, this glass, and I didn't want to put it right up to the edge, but it's, it's, it's almost full. It's just right here close to the top. You know, if, if I'm going to get a glass of tea or if I'm going to get something cold to drink, I don't want this much. I want as much as I can get in here without spilling it. And, and you know, the more Holy Spirit we have living on the inside of us, the less room we'll have for the things of the world. The Bible says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. You don't need to have a lot of worldly ways and lustly, uh, lust for things of the pleasures of this life. You need to walk and follow, run after the Spirit of the Lord. It says, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. We're supposed to be singing God a love song every day. And when you're spirit-filled, it's not hard to do that. I, it's easy for me all through the day. Lord, touch our people. God, you know, I just got a phone call a while ago. I, we've got a member that needs your help, God. Uh, it, Father, in the name of Jesus, meet that need. I can't be right there just like that on, on the second when they need, but your Holy Spirit can go right into the room where they're at. He, he, it's just it's such, a, uh, it's such a needed thing for us to work in God's kingdom having the Spirit of God operating in us. Teaching goals, to impart and reinforce knowledge, to show us the fact that it is God's will for how many of us to have it? For every Christian to live a Holy Spirit-filled life. The Word says, Be ye holy as I am holy, for without holiness no man shall see God. Do you know what makes us holy? We don't have any righteousness. The Bible says, that, Is there any righteous? No, not one. So if we don't have any righteousness or holiness, where does it come from? It comes from the Holy Spirit that lives on the inside of you, and our sanctification comes from the blood of Jesus that was shed for you. It's not, a salvation is a free gift from God, lest any man should boast. It's not in our talent and our abilities. It's all uh, thanks be to what God has done for us. Amen? And, and we should want to uh, do that in our everyday Christian walk and life to live a Holy Spirit-filled and a Holy Spirit-led life. Influence attitudes uh, to evoke an appreciation for the gift of the Holy Spirit and the desire to be filled with the Spirit. And the third part is to influence our behavior. Uh, and, and you know, I'm, you say, well, we read this every week about influencing our behavior. Your, your behavior, you're going one way or the other. You're either going to follow the fleshly ways and you're going to do some despicable, nasty things or you're going to walk in the Spirit of the Lord. There's only two paths to choose. There's no middle ground. So we want to be influenced, our behavior to be influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit so we welcome the Holy Spirit into our lives every day and to be submissive to His Holy Influence. See, we don't like, people do not like being submissive anymore. You're in a society today, I, I saw something on TV day before yesterday, it said gun violence across our nation is up 300%. Well, sure, it, it's up 300%. It's a wonder it ain't up 
Anytime you got a bunch of heathens and derelicts running all over our country, looting and burning stores to the ground, killing people, assaulting cops, and everything else under the sun, and if a policeman that makes $35,000 a year putting his life on the line, it, it, that badge represents uh, uh, the people of this country. He is the authority. And when he says freeze, they're supposed to stop. But if they pull a weapon on him or go to assault him and he has to shoot and kill them, see, they don't want to be submissive to authority today. And that's the same thing that happens in the church world. People do not want to submit their fleshly ways to the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, if you're going to lead a, a successful, a victorious Christian life, you will submit you will submit your ways to God and the power of the Holy Spirit, then you won't walk in the flesh. Amen? So uh, it, th that would be a good lesson for our whole society to hear tonight. It, it's not good that, 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 that we tell people one thing, this is what the law is, but then we don't enforce it. And when the law does try to enforce it, then we want to put the policeman in jail for enforcing the laws that they were hired to enforce. Well, our society is almost in chaos today. The only thing that is keeping the world together and from falling apart are God's people here who are still praying in the Spirit. We're still seeking after God and saying, Lord, just be merciful. Give us a little bit longer to win our loved ones. We don't want anybody dying lost and going to hell. God, that's what's holding right now the world together. The Lord is being merciful because it's not his will that any would be lost, but that all would come to repentance. Amen? Amen. Uh, historical literary background. This lesson contains one passage of Scripture from the book of Numbers dating to the time of Moses about 1445 B.C. The other texts for this lesson are from the New Testament. The day of Pentecost events described in Acts 2 are believed to occur in A.D. 30, about seven weeks, here we are again, after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. In Luke, his account of the gospel, and in the book of, uh, and in the book of Acts, that's the only New Testament writer who tells that Jesus commanded his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the coming of the Holy Spirit. That's found in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, and Acts 1 and 4. And then he tells them about the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. So let's go to the Word for just a minute. In Numbers 11 and 25, we'll go all the way back uh, to the Old Testament it says, Then the Lord came down in a cloud and spoke to him, Moses. Isn't that wonderful that God did that? Came down and spoke to Moses and took of the spirit that was upon him and placed the same spirit upon the 70 elders. And it happened when the spirit rested upon them that they prophesied, although they never did so again. How did they prophesy? They prophesied through the power of the Holy Spirit. Then Moses said to him, now, now you've skipped down here from Numbers 11 and 25, now we're skipping down to verse 29. Joshua had really gotten upset because these 70 guys were prophesying and speaking the words of the Lord. He thought that only Moses should be able to do that. So look what Moses says to him here in verse 29. Then Moses said to Joshua, are you zealous for my sake? Uh, see, Joshua wanted to stop them from speaking in tongues and prophesying because he only thought that Moses could prophesy. And here Moses is correcting his thinking. He's letting them know, I need some help. And the only way I'm going to be able to spread this gospel and share it, we're going to need other people who are influenced by the same thing that's influencing me, the power of the Holy Spirit. So he said, Joshua, don't be zealous for my sake. Don't worry about me. I'm not offended if they get the Holy Ghost too. You know, a, a real pastor, if you've got some talents and abilities and, and you can sing or you can teach or you can do it, we're not going to be jealous or we're not going to be upset about the gifts that you have. I wish people would step forward. I can use the gifts that you have in our church, but you've got to be led by the Spirit before we can use you. 
Amen. And that's what Moses is saying. He said, oh, that the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. He said, I desperately need the help. And the only way I can use them, Joshua, is for God to fill them with his spirit. Okay? Uh, let's, now we skip ahead out of the Old Testament to the New Testament to Acts 2 and 4. It says, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The Spirit is the one who gives the utterance and the tongues. Uh, I've seen things online where they say, you can take a class, we can teach you how to speak in tongues. You don't need anybody to teach you how to speak in tongues. All you need to do is get in deep prayer with God and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins, sanctify my heart, cleanse me from the uh, Adamic nature, eradicate it out of me. Now I'm an empty vessel yielded to you, Lord. Fill me just like this glass. Fill me up with the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit will come and live on the inside of you, and he will, if you'll yield to him, he will use you. I've seen people that were spirit-led, spirit-filled, but they didn't necessarily have the gift of tongues. Everybody don't go around. Uh, Y'all, our church knows Andrew. Andrew will dance, speak in tongues. That is a every time you walk in the door thing. He is, that. not only is he filled with the Holy Spirit, he has the gift of tongues. And, and there's several gifts. God gives the gifts as he sees fit in the body of Christ. And, and you've got people today, they're seeking the, the tongue instead of the Holy Spirit. We talked about the Ark of the Covenant last week at church. People had faith in the Ark and not the God of the Ark. It, it, you know, the tongue is not what you seek after. The Holy Spirit is what you need to seek after. Then if you're going to have the gift of tongues, God will bring those. Amen? Amen. So let, let's go back here for a second. It says, they spoke as the Spirit gave them utter, utterance. And uh, verse 16 says, but this is what was spoken uh, by the prophet Joel. They're letting them know you shouldn't be surprised about this. This has been prophesied for years that this gift was coming. And when God makes a promise, you can take it to the bank. He's going to fulfill that promise. And, and Joel had prophesied it, and then Jesus had also let them know to tarry and wait. And then the Holy Spirit, it's, expe it's important for me to go away, because if I don't go away, the Holy Spirit won't come. And Jesus keeps his promises. And we know what happened in Acts 2. That promise came true to all those people that day. In, in verse 17, it says, And it shall come to pass in the last days. When's that? In the last days. And you and I are definitely, definitely living in the last days. It says, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And that's what's been happening at Faith Family. God's been pouring it out. He, it's just running loose all over the place. If people, it, it, do you remember the story in the Bible? There was a man who had been lame for 38 years. And, and at certain times of the year, the Lord, the angel of the Lord come down, he would stir the water, and the first one that would step in would receive their healing. Well, receiving the Holy Spirit is the same way. When you feel the Spirit begin to move in church, don't just sit on your pew. Get up and step in while the outpouring is taking place and you can be spirit. Oh, and the power that you'll have, it, it says you'll be endued with power from on high after the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So we want that spirit in these last days that we're in. He said, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. You know, I, I've had dreams for the, for the church that we're in. I've got dreams for faith family. The Bible says where the people have no vision, they perish. So God gave me a vision for the property, not only for the property, but that we need the Spirit of the Lord operating and moving in our church services. You don't need a bunch of, of Jezebel spirits and mean-spirited people running your church wherever you're at. You need the Spirit of the Lord operating in that church. 
That's the first thing and the most important thing. When we worship it with everything we have, when we allow the Holy Spirit to operate, those wicked spirits have got to go because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. And when you worship, it says if we worship, God inhabits the praises of his people. The Spirit of God comes down. We host that Spirit. We invite that Spirit as a church. That's what God wants. When you open your heart and you host the Spirit of the Lord, he will fulfill the promise of filling you with the Holy Spirit. And it says, he'll pour it out and they'll see visions. They'll have dreams. And the dream needs to be the dream that the Lord has given you. In my ministry, I've learned this. Uh, what I had in mind when I first started preaching is nothing. It, it, it absolutely went nothing uh, the way I thought, but it went the way God thought it should go. And can I tell you, God's way is better, always much, much, much better than our way if we'll yield to it. Amen? It says in verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. See, we, we need each other. There's going to be days you're going to have bad days, and there's going to be days I'm going to have bad days. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. Do you know how you live a victorious life? Get you some friends that love God with all their heart, mind, body, and soul, and they're operating in the gifts of the Spirit. And when you get around those people, it's hard for you. You can't be anxious and depressed all the time when all of your friends are filled with the Spirit. <laughs> we're we're going to walk in victory. Amen? Everybody's not going to be down on the same day. So it says we walk in fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Uh, our church has a prayer line. On Monday nights, we, we, uh, uh, the prayers are coming in all day Monday, and then they're read on Monday evening. You say, well, I haven't been taking part with us. It's not my fault. It's not anybody else's in the church's fault. If you're not doing it, it's your fault if you're not doing that. The church is doing that. They're operating in that. They're praying for one another. They're in unity with one another. We need one another. And, and the Bible says where two or three agree in prayer, touching on any one thing, they will have it. So there's going to be times when you need a miracle and you're going to need people who are like-minded, who have the faith to agree with you and touch on that thing and God will move then. Amen? So we need one another. Ephesians 5 and 18, it says, And do not be drunk with wine, in, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And I've got down here that, that, that we need to let the Holy Spirit have full control. If we're filled with the Spirit, we're going to walk in the Spirit. If we're filled with the sinful ways and the lust of this world, we're going to walk in the lust of the flesh. So you got to be full of something. Make sure that it's God's Spirit that you're full of. Amen? Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and singing spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. The Bible tells us the joy of the Lord is our strength. When people come into our house of worship, they ought to see the happiest group of folks they've ever met in their life. Because if you don't have any joy in the Lord, you don't have any strength. Amen? It says, um, giving thanks always for all thanks to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of God. And Galatians 5, 22, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit. The Lord's telling you, if you have the Holy Spirit, this is the fruit that's going to come out of you having the Holy Spirit. If you plant an apple tree, you're going to see some fruit sometime down the road or it needs to be chopped down and cast into the fire, the Word said. If you plant an orange tree, you're going to see some oranges on there after a while. So what is the fruit? What comes from us having the Holy Spirit? He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and without these attributes, you are not living a victorious Christian life. You're not walking in the Spirit. And it says, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. In Acts 4 and 31, it says, and when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken, 
And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke as the word of God gave them boldness. The day that we're living in today to be a witness for Christ, to be able to walk up to somebody and tell them about what the Lord has done for you, or to be a Sunday school teacher, or a youth pastor, or a pastor, an evangelist, whatever, you better have a boldness because the world is bold in what they believe. I, I saw a report uh, day before yesterday that said only uh, that 40, I believe it was, uh, and I was talking to Brother Billy Yates about this, only 43% uh, or 43% of millennials today don't believe in any God at all. That means that almost half of this generation, if we don't reach them, if we don't allow the Holy Spirit to move through us and conviction to grip them, they are lost because if you don't believe in God, there's no way you're going to heaven. Amen? So, uh, I mean, we're in a desperate time where people need to feel the power of God. When they come in your church, they ought to feel the power of worship. When you preach, they ought to feel the power of the word. When they go to the altar and your people come around them and lay hands on them, they ought to feel the power of the Holy Spirit operating in that altar. God's the one. He's the one that does the work. It's the anointing that breaks the yoke. I don't care how talented a preacher you are or a teacher you are. Without the Spirit of God, you are nothing, my friend. It's in God. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches, and without me, you can do nothing. Without the Holy Spirit today operating in us, we won't accomplish any good thing. Amen? Amen. So let's go back here. It says, after they had prayed, the place was shaken. They were all filled, and they all had this boldness. 2 Corinthians 3 and 5 said, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves. They're saying, it's not in our abilities. It's not in our talent. So what is it in? But our efficiency, or, or our sufficiency, is in, is in God. God equips those that he calls he will give you what you need for service when you're serving him. And verse 6, it says, Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. Here it is. He's telling us again. We've got the Holy Spirit. That's what makes us success, successful even in our ministries. We have the power of the Holy Spirit that God has given us. He said, Because the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. And in Him, you can have, if you walk in the power of the Holy Spirit, you can have life more abundantly. It, introducing the lesson, it said, it is important to be filled with the Holy Spirit so we can be spiritually equipped to live a victorious Christian life and so we can engage in effective Christian life ministry. Why does it say we need to be filled with the Spirit? So we can engage in effective Christian ministry in the use of the gifts and the callings that we have received from Christ. Let's go back here for just a minute. I want to read something else. It says, under being filled with the Spirit, it said, as Moses' assistants, these men needed to be filled uh, to be enabled by the Holy Spirit. Moses had them gathered around the tabernacle and the Lord took of the spirit that was upon Moses and gave it to the 70 elders and they prophesied and did not cease or never did so again. In the Old Testament era, prophesying was the normal thing. It was, uh, it was immediately observable evidence that a person had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. When they received the Holy Spirit, they began to speak. See, now we get upset about that word prophesying, but you know what it means literally? You will be able to speak into other people's lives. They will feel the Spirit of God that is in you, and they'll open up to you, and you can speak into their lives because of what God is doing in your life and in your ministry. However, it says two of the chosen elders... Uh, Eldad and Medad were in the camp when they received the gift of the Holy Spirit and prophesied. When a young man reported to Moses that they were prophesying in the camp, Joshua and a servant counseled Moses to forbid them to prophesy. Uh, and to this Moses replied, 
Would to God that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit upon them. Moses says, don't stop them. I need all the help I can get. I want everybody that will receive the gift of God to receive it because then they can help me in this work that I'm doing. The gift of the spirit received by the 70 elders and Moses, uh, uh, it's this gift that the Lord would give his spirit to all of his people through this gift. And, and, and prophetically, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit would come to the church on the day of Pentecost. And now I've got a couple questions for application. It says, why do we regard uh, the historical episode told in Numbers 11, uh, chapter 11, verses 24 through 29, as prefiguring the outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the day uh, of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Well, didn't the same thing that happened in Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4, didn't it also happen in Numbers chapter 11, 24 through 29? God took of the Holy Spirit that was on Moses. He poured it out on those 70 men. They began to speak in tongues and prophesy. It's the same thing that happened in Acts chapter 2. So this is why we regard this uh, as the prefiguring or the, or the early coming of the Holy Spirit. People say, I've got a problem. I always thought the first time the Holy Spirit ever showed up was in Acts chapter 2. And I said, well, it's not. And uh, I've even had people to say, well, if you could prove that to me in Scripture... And if you show them this in Numbers, they say, oh, that's Old Testament. I don't know about that when it talked about the Spirit. I don't know if it meant the Holy Spirit coming down and doing the same work that was done uh, in Acts chapter 2 where they literally spoke in tongues. So if you can't show me in the Bible anywhere else where uh, somebody spoke in tongues before Acts 2, I'm not going to receive it. And I said, okay, well, how about let's go to the New Testament itself. When, uh, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus... She went and visited uh, their cousin Elizabeth, and it says when Mary spoke to Elizabeth and greeted her that Elizabeth was also pregnant with what would be the future John the Baptist, and it says when Mary spoke to her that John the Baptist leapt in his mother's womb and was filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? So we can definitely say that the uh, Acts 2 didn't take place until after the resurrection of Jesus. He had lived his entire life, and then he, uh, seven weeks after he was resurrected, here comes the Holy Ghost in Acts chapter 2. And I can definitely tell you that it was about 30-something years before that that John was filled in his mother's womb with the Holy Ghost. So, and, and I can go further than that. It says in the very, the very beginning of creation that the earth was void and without form and the Spirit of the Lord hovered over the face of the deep. The Holy Spirit has always been. He's that third part of the Trinity. He always has been. He is right now, and he's always going to be because he is God. All three are. And people have a problem with that. Trinitarians understand what I'm talking about. You got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. Amen? Amen. So I'm not going to get too deep into that, but let's go to the response to the Word. The entire Christian era... The time in which God's Spirit is being poured out on believers in Christ is God's answer to Moses' prayer in Numbers 11 and 29. Believers in Christ can and should be filled with the Holy Spirit. In regeneration, that is, the new birth, we receive the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and are baptized spiritually by the Spirit into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12 and 13 says, Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit by regeneration identifies us as children of God. Then afterwards, subsequent to the new birth, we can, we can by Christ be baptized in or filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and it empowers us for Christian living and for ministry. For time's sake, I want to skip forward here. It says, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. Jesus taught that we can distinguish who is truly good by their character and their deeds, the fruit of their lives. 
In keeping with this teaching of Jesus, the most compelling evidence that an individual is filled with the Holy Spirit is the fruit of the Spirit in his or her life. The fruit or the produce of the harvest of the Spirit are those Christ-like virtues the Holy Spirit produces in our life. The Holy Spirit produces fruit in a Christian's life as we submit to his holy influence. Spirit-filled living is not uh, difficult to discern or describe. It is Christ-like living, and this should be the goal of every believer in Christ. Amen? Let's go on. Um, I want to read one more response to the Word, then we'll do call to discipleship and ministry in action. Response to the Word. People are sometimes heard to say, I cannot live the Christian life. It's just too hard. In our self, in our flesh, it is not just hard. Friend, it is impossible to do the things that, that are required of us by God's Word by trying to do it in our own abilities and our own talents. But look at what it says. The fact is, anyone who says that it's too hard is speaking the truth. But again, back to that scripture, Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Without me, you can do nothing. So you better have Jesus living on the inside and the power of the Holy Spirit operating if you're going to have any fruit in your life. Nevertheless, this is no excuse for not living the Christian life. Recognizing we cannot do it ourselves should alert us to the fact that we can live a Christ-like life only by being sincerely committed to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and when we are committed to Christ and to His Holy Spirit, it will come and dwell in us, and then we are enabled by God through the Holy Spirit to live Christ-like. Uh, likewise, we are also made able to do Christian ministry by being filled with the Holy Spirit. The call to discipleship. It says, when we pray to be filled with the Holy Spirit, we are also asking to be filled with God and Christ. Often, when people pray to be filled with the Spirit, they do not think about this. When we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we submit to the sovereign wisdom, power, and authority that God has over our lives, and we submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. We also submit to the holy influence of the Holy Spirit over our lives. Living in the Spirit is Christian discipleship. You know, that's something that takes time. We've got to learn to let Him rule and reign in our hearts and in our minds. Ministry in action. It says, are you aware of fellow believers in Christ who are seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Pray for them that they will receive the gift of of the Holy Spirit because they are going to need it for power, for service if they're going to serve in the kingdom of God. So let's go back one more time, read this. Be filled with what? You're going to be filled with one or the other. Be filled not with the ways of the world and lustly, fleshly ways, sinful ways, but be filled with the Spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. And thank you, God, for the gift. And that's exactly what it is, a gift of the Holy Spirit. God, help us to yield our ways to his ways. Help us to have the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, contentment, long-suffering. Help us to love one another. Help us to be in unity and help us to be obedient to the ways of the Holy Spirit, then we can walk in victory in our everyday Christian life. We pray it. We believe it over our people tonight, Father. Bless them all, Father, in Jesus' name. Be blessed, church.